Hi, I'm Sky Jatani. I'm the managing editor of Leadership Journal and Ottaver.com. I'm an ordained pastor, and I'm the author of The Divine Commodity, Discovering a Faith Beyond Consumer Christianity. I have just a few minutes to talk to you today about something that's important to ministry. Uh, as I've gotten around various ministry conferences and settings, two things I keep hearing over and over again is that either the reason we're having so much trouble in the church today is because we lack the right strategies, or the reason we're having trouble is because we in leadership just aren't motivated enough, that somehow we lack uh, a passion, a desire, a fire to see the mission of the gospel advance. To be honest with you, I don't think either one of those really get at the core issue that we're dealing with today. One says that we're not educated or resourced enough. The other says that we're not motivated or godly enough. I don't think that's the issue. Most of the people I've met in ministry are really godly people who care deeply about the mission of the gospel. And I think we've got more resources and things at our disposal to advance Christ's mission than any Christians who've ever lived. So I don't think it's about strategies. I don't think it's about motivation. I think a lot of what's going on in us happens at a deeper level than those things. There's a soul issue, an identity issue. What I want to talk to you about today is a danger that I call the Daisy Cutter Doctrine. The Daisy Cutter is the largest non-nuclear weapon in the Army's arsenal. And nowadays, this weapon is not dropped because we're trying to kill hundreds of thousands of people. The reason why the Army drops that bomb, and they're explicit about this, is to intimidate the enemy. They recognize that the sound of the explosion and the shockwave is so enormous that it just shocks and, and devastates an entire area. What I call the daisy cutter doctrine is a lie that I think a lot of us in ministry have fallen into, which is the belief that the larger the impact of our ministry, the more legitimate we are as ministers of the gospel. So we've equated large with legitimate. And I just think that's eating our souls and giving us a burden in ministry that's sucking the joy out of us and actually inhibiting us from doing the good work that God may have called us to do. One way this is reinforced is even in the ministry conferences that we participate in and we go to. I mean, how many ministry conferences have you gone to over the years where one of the keynote speakers was a pastor of a church of 100 or 150? It's almost unheard of. There are always pastors of really big churches or pastors or leaders who've had huge impact. And what's subtly implied by that is that the larger your impact, the more legitimate you are in ministry. The unspoken judgment is that if your impact isn't big, then you're not legitimate. And when we internalize that message, it can put a huge burden on us. And I think it's unfairly burdening a lot of pastors that I've met throughout the country. What's interesting is you just don't see this in the life of Jesus. If we were to take the things that we measure our success by and apply them to the ministry of Jesus, a lot of times we'd have to conclude that he was a failure. Quite often in ministry, people were leaving Jesus rather than coming to him. And by the end of his earthly ministry, there was no one left. He was abandoned by everyone. And yet, his ministry was a success because he was completely faithful to his father. One of the stories I read in seminary that began to transform my understanding of ministry was from Numbers chapter 20. In that story, Moses is still leading the people during the Exodus, and they're in the wilderness, and they're complaining that there's no water. Well, God gives Moses an instruction to speak to the rock, and water will come out. Moses completely disobeys God, and he strikes the rock with his staff rather than speaking to it, and yet a miracle occurs anyway. And the people are fed, and water comes forth, and everyone celebrates. And yet at the end of the story, the Lord condemns Moses for disobeying him and forbids him from entering the promised land. And what I realized as I started to internalize that story is that maybe the outcomes of my ministry are not an accurate portrayal of my legitimacy in ministry. I mean, here was Moses, disobedient to God, and yet somehow a miracle occurs through him. It's pretty obvious in that story that God was working in spite of Moses, not because of him. Yet how often do we judge our own effectiveness based on the tangible outcomes of our ministry? Or do we judge someone else's ministry based on the evidence of those outcomes? And yet this is a, a really dangerous and slippery slope for us to move down. Because we begin to recognize that someone is being used by God in a powerful way, and then we may incorrectly conclude that they must be a legitimate, godly leader. Or the lack of tangible outcomes in my ministry must, must mean that there's something wrong with me, there's something deficient, there must be some sin, some lack of proper strategy or motivation when that may not be the case. So somehow we've got to get our attention off of the tangible outcomes of our ministry as being evidence of our legitimacy and root it in something deeper. 
I think that something deeper is exactly what Jesus rooted his ministry in. He said that his bread, what sustained his life, was to do the will of his Father. Of course, Jesus' ministry begins with his baptism when the clouds part and the voice of the Father speaks from heaven and says that this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I think Jesus had his identity rooted in the fact that he was the beloved Son of the Father. How different would our ministries be and our souls be and our joys be if we disconnected our legitimacy from the outcomes of our ministry and instead rooted our identity and our legitimacy in the fact that we are sons and daughters of our loving Father? What burden would be lifted from us? What joy would be captured in our ministries again? Here's what I really want to emphasize. We're called to abandon the outcomes to the Lord. Paul said that, to the Corinthian church, he came and planted the seed of the gospel. Apollos came and watered that seed, but God is the one who caused the growth. The outcomes of ministry do not belong to us. They belong to our Father. Our calling is to deeply commune with Him, to experience His love, His forgiveness, His grace and power in our lives, and then truly and obediently do what He's calling us to do, but abandon the outcomes to Him. I think if we do that, we'll find ministry looks very, very different. So, three things in closing. One, your legitimacy does not come from the impact of your ministry. Your legitimacy comes from the fact that you are a child of God, holy and dearly loved. Secondly, if outcomes are in God's hands and not yours, then you need to stop judging your legitimacy based on the tangible outcomes of your ministry and stop judging others based on that as well. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we are to judge no one according to the flesh. We don't look at the things the world looks at to look to judge someone's legitimacy or standing with God. There's a whole different criteria that we have to look at. Finally, if we're truly rooted, or if our identity is truly rooted in Christ, and if that's where we get our legitimacy from, then I think we're going to find the power and the strength to defy the expectations of the culture around us and even the people within our own churches even though they may be rooted in the expectations of our culture, we are not. And like Jesus on Palm Sunday, we can find the power to defy the people around us and obey what our Father's calling is for us and no one else. So, I know it's a simple idea. You're probably going to get bombarded all day long with tons of great ministry ideas and resources from other leaders. But I hope you'll take just a few minutes to think through where does your legitimacy come from? Is it the outcomes of your ministry Or is it your identity in Christ? And hopefully, as you get grounded more and more in your identity in Christ, you'll find freedom and joy once again in the calling that Christ has given you. Thanks for this time and to be able to talk with you. I hope it was helpful.